My name is Alan Starr, and I wanted to take a few minutes. I get, get to come to you uh, once a year and talk about what I do with Wycliffe Bible Transfers and what we do together. I know many of you are new in the body, so I wanted to, to review real quick. I, I joined Wycliffe right out of college in 1985 and spent my first term in Cameroon, Africa. That's a picture of me. There is a single guy, younger than my son Peter is now. I was there in Africa. Spent three, two and a half years in Africa. A year and a half, though, I spent in France before I went to Africa, and I met that, that woman in the picture in the middle there. Um, I met Diet in France for one month, and God uh, was gracious to us. We got married almost four years to the day, and we were grafted into the upper room. I was grafted in the upper room. Diet was already attending here. We had a reception here a month after we got married. Went on and, um, and were able to work in Africa for uh, 14 years as a family. It was there 18 years. We came here to West Lafayette in 2007. Uh, that picture there on the, on the, the left side is uh, how we looked back in, in 07. And then the picture on the right there, a, a pretty recent picture um, with adult children now and two little grandkids. And that's really the joy that we have, Dad and I have at this time, is to be able to be grandparents to Banaya and to Kaylee. That picture there was on Kaylee's first birthday. Banaya is four and Kaylee is one. Banaya, many of you are praying for Banaya. If you want to pray, continue to pray for Benaya. He has smooth brain condition, technically called lysencephaly. So his brain doesn't have all the folds of a normal brain. He's severely handicapped in that way. But by the grace of God, we're praying for healing and miracles. Because of the brain's elasticity, uh, there's really not a limit to what God can do and, and what through physical therapy and muscle memory, Lord willing, Benaya will be able to... Uh, to walk and talk, I'm praying. His talking may only be sign language, but um, I believe God wants to use Benai. He's already using him. There's a Facebook page, and over 900 people are tracking with Benai's life. And many of you in this body are praying for him, and I thank you for doing that, praying for miracles for Benai. Um, Yet and I were able to go and work uh, among the Moloko people in North Cameroon, we were there for 11 years and left a foundation for the Moloko to go on and, and do the New Testament. If you go back on the table, uh, there's, there's a place to sign up to receive a newsletter. You want to get specifics to pray during the year um, for me. Um, and there's the picture there on the right. There's some of the books that were printed in the Moloko language. There are copies of them on that back table. Pick up a, news, um, a prayer card. And you can pray for um, the work that I'm able to do with Wycliffe. Lord willing, uh, we're going to get to see the Moloko New Testament dedicated in the next few years. And you guys have been walking with us through that whole process. We left that foundation and they're doing that work. So that's what Upper Room has done for over 30 years. Amen. Upper Room supported, before Upper Room was supporting Diet and me, they supported other Wycliffe missionaries and have continued to do that. So the work that we're doing is, is a work to see this accomplished, and it really is encouraging um, to see that happen. This, this is a, a map of languages still unengaged, without scripture, still 1,200 language communities, over 1,200, 99, representing 99 million people without a verse of scripture in their language. But as the president of Wycliffe said, globally, worldwide, God is raising up churches to do uh, translation and people, peoples all over the world uh, seeing the work of Bible translation advance. Matthew 24, 14 says, This good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony, testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I believe the first part of that verse has already been accomplished. Throughout the whole world, the good news is preached. Through internet and technology, people all over the world can hear the gospel. But that last part, as a testimony to all nations, 
The word nations in Greek is ethnos, which we get our word ethnic, the ethnic groups. Still, we just saw the map before, over 1,200 ethnic groups don't have a verse of scripture in their language. How can they know the testimony of the, of the love of Jesus? So there's work to be done. Continue to pray um, as we move forward. Um, the work of Bible translation was emphasized by the founder of the U.S. Center for World Missions. He said, without a credible Bible, missions is worth very little. The history of missions is mostly a history of the impact of the Bible. And so we've, we've worked together, we've walked together to see the work of Bible translation completed around the world. Dr. Winter helped found the U.S. Center for World Missions, and that was the organization, the umbrella organization that started the Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. Our church is going to host the first of, hopefully, which will be an annual thing, of a class called the Perspectives on the World Christian Movement. You've heard that about that, that class. I encourage you, I strongly encourage you to consider attending. You might have children that are, are thinking, well, could I be a missionary? For you to understand better what that would entail, that class gives an excellent opportunity for people to understand and just for us to have a better understanding of the world and God's heart for the nations. Amen? Amen. So just a, a, a brief talk. We, we saw sign language mentioned, but this is an exciting part for me and actually where I work, we'll see in a minute, I'm working in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo, but Andrew Foster Andrew Foster was an African-American man. It's a picture of him there in the corner. He was born in 1925 here in America. Not a great time to be an African-American man in, in the United States. And at age 11, he became deaf because of meningitis. But God had his hand on his life, and, and, and by the time he had, was able to finish educate, his education, he went to Africa and in 1957, when he went to Africa, there were only 12 deaf schools in the whole continent. But he, through his work, he was able to establish over 25 different deaf schools in 17 countries. Amen. And you see those countries right there listed. I was talking to our brother David in Deritu, and he said when he went to high school in Nairobi, just next door there was a deaf school. And very likely it was a deaf school that was started by this man. And what's exciting is that because of this man's work, selflessly going when it was hard, right? That time of, of, uh, <laughs> in history, it wasn't an easy thing for a guy to go and do what he did. But he started those schools because 17 different countries have deaf schools. The schools that he established have a relationship to American Sign Language. And American Sign Language is the only deaf sign language in the world that has a whole Bible. And because of those languages being related to ASL, because of his work, translation in all of those languages is going to be accelerated. So it's really, really exciting. Um, I work in these two countries. Um, on Friday, I'm leaving, uh, catching a plane from Indiana to, to Atlanta to Johannesburg. 50, I heard it's 15-hour flight. How many of you, yeah, anyway, you want to join me on 15 hours in a, in a metal tube screening through? Anyway, we're going to go. I'm going to land in Johannesburg and then fly up to Lubumbashi, the tip of the country on the right there in red, the tip of uh, the DRC. I'll be there for training, uh, training to learn how to help communities understand the, 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 the scope of Bible translation and whether they should engage in this work of Bible translation? Do they need the scriptures in their language? Or could they use it in another language? Here in America, we don't have an understanding, very clear understanding of what multilingualism is. Um, all over the world, people speak more than one language. In America, we speak English, mostly, right? Um, but So we're going to learn how to, to help communities wrestle with the, the need for Bible translation. The Zela people We'll spend three days learning how to do this workshop, and then the Zela people will come, and we're going to actually do the workshop with them and help them understand. Do the Zela need scripture? We'll find out. Um, I'll come back here and spend about two weeks, and then I'll be flying off to Benin. Benin's not 
Albania is another country, but we're going to be actually training, again, training the men and women that we work with, that I work with when I'm in these two countries, helping them understand the processes that Wycliffe U.S. is involved in, in doing Bible translation. So in the next two months, I'll be making two trips to Africa. It's kind of crazy, but I share that for you to pray. When you know that I'm not here, just really know uh, we're, I'm so thankful for the Upper Room's prayer, for the faithful partnership and giving. Um, Wycliffe has a debt of gratitude to the Upper Room for all the years that the Upper Room has partnered and helped Bible translation move forward. I was in Fe just February, I was in the uh, Republic of Congo. So in that green country, I was there in Brazzaville, and we went, and I was able to meet with the Ketuba Bible translation team. The four men, the woman to the left is the woman who helps me do my work. She's the language programs coordinator. But the four men that I was with there, all four of them have given blood, sweat, and tears, hours of translating the Old Testament into Ketuba. All four of them are, are heavily involved in their church, in their local church. They, they do this work of, of Bible translation, but then there's this weight of, of um, challenge for them to, to also carry responsibility in the churches. Anyway, the Ketubah, Lord willing, by the end of this year, the Ketubah Bible will be done. And um, there's going to be opportunities in the next few years for anybody who wants to go and see a, new, uh, a Bible translation or New Testament uh, dedication for, to join me and go and see people receive the Word of God in their language for the first time. I think it's pretty exciting. When Diet and I were in Cameroon, we were able to do that a few times. But to see people receive God's Word in their language, it's kind of crazy, right? Because we just grow up with it. We have so many different versions. Anyway, put that in the back of your mind. You could be a part of going and actually seeing uh, the New Testament, a dedication, people receive it in their language. Um, that same in, in the Republic of Congo, several teams, um, that same in, in the Republic of Congo, several teams got together just for two weeks later, earlier this month, and they spent the two weeks working through revelations and being sure that the translation that they were doing was, was an accurate translation and an effective translation. And um, so these are the people that I, I am a liaison for. I'm a field coordinator. I, I represent funders. That workshop was able to be done because men and women, people who are philanthropists, were able to give money to see the, the, they're giving money to see the translation work advance in nine different languages in the Republic of Congo. Lord willing, there are many languages in the Democratic Republic of Congo that will come online for translation as well. But uh, that's not happening yet. So I want to just show one short video, and then we'll uh, get into a message. This video just talks about the, the importance and the value of um, Bible translation, the legacy that Bible translation leaves in the hearts of people. The legacy of our work it's transformed lives, transformed communities, better communities, peaceful communities, disciplined communities, and communities living together with a hope that one day they will be with the Lord. One day they will be able to say, like I've always quoted, Jesus is no longer a stranger. He is no longer a foreigner. He is one of us and he speaks our language. That legacy of transformed lives is what we are looking forward to. We take for granted having the Bible in English, don't we? Amen. Right? We grow up with it. There, there are so many different versions of the Bible in English, and we have it, but for these people that are, is coming, we can rejoice with them, but pray. There, there are some sheets out there of different projects. Pick up a sheet, and you can join and pray for one of the languages, language projects that I'm um, a liaison for. 
I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about um, finding Father's love. What's Father's, God, our Father God's love? How, we, we sang so many different songs. I appreciated the songs that Kevin picked out. Talked about our heart, knowing the love of God. The love of God is greater far than, than pen or scribe. That, that song, it's like, and we, we see this in Ephesians 3.14. Paul's writing to the Ephesians, he says, when I think of all this, so he's been talking about so many aspects of who God is and his love for the church. And, but Paul says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, and then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Those first two verses, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Paul's prayer helps us to experience, know how to experience God's, God's love. First of all, he's, his posture. He thinks about it. He falls to his knees. Falls to his knees. So Paul literally fell to his knees, I'm certain, in prayer. I, I confess, it's been a long time since I get on, you know, get on my knees to pray. I saw a brother of a friend. I was, I was rooming with a friend at a recent retreat, and to see him get on his knees before he went, got into his bed and, and went to sleep was amazing, right? Maybe even convicting a little bit, but what's the posture of our heart, right? My heart, am I, am I surrendered to God, right? Falling to my knees. And then we're praying to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, that from his glorious unlimited resources he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. The provision, there's his unlimited resources. God's unlimited resources are available for us, for you. Paul says, I'm, I'm asking that God, be, through his unlimited resources, that he's going to do what he goes on to pray. And it's not something we stir up, right? But that through those resources, he'll empower us with inner strength through his spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. I believe for us to experience the love of the Father, we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. Paul makes it clear that that's, he's, he's, He's depending on the, the Holy Spirit to work in, in us, right? In our flesh, in our, in our, in our, um, even in our effort just to understand, right? We can miss so much. But if we're depending on the Spirit, we're leaning into the Spirit of God. I believe Paul's prayer can be answered. Amen? Amen. He says, when I do all this, then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will go down, grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And, you, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people sh should how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. So, then Christ will make his home in your heart. What's that? idea of Christ making his home in my heart. You know, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and, and hang out. I mean, the, the message says, I'll, I'll come and, and, you know, we'll eat, we'll eat together. We'll share a meal together. We'll be together. Um, God is looking for that kind of relationship with us, right? And, the, and Paul just prays, 
then Christ will make his home in your hearts. How many of you want to have Christ at home in your heart? Yeah, right? That's, that's our desire. But the reality is life, life can get really kind of, kind of hectic. And maybe I didn't read my Bible this week, or maybe I didn't miss, maybe, maybe I didn't even, you know? And it's like Paul says, look, I'm getting on my knees, I'm praying, I'm saying, God, come. God is, God, God's not busy. God's not over, over scheduled, right? And he's waiting for us to call on him. And his desire is to have communion with us, to, to sit down and eat a meal, to share a meal together, to be in fellowship with him. John seven thirty eight says, anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the Scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Anyone who comes to me and believes in me can come and drink. And rivers of living water. We, we need rivers of living water, amen? amen. Water, water is such a blessing. The rain that we've gotten this last week is such a blessing, right? It, it, it helps awaken the spring. The, the images of living water. Jeremiah, or John, John saying here, Jesus, that living water is going to flow from your heart? We need that. Yeah. I need living water. I need that water to be flowing from my heart. Um, he says, Paul goes on to say that uh, when he said, home in my heart, as you trust in him, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 is really good. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They're like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. So that image of a tree that doesn't dry up, of a tree that's not concerned with the drought, tree that its roots go down into what? Into the living water, the living water that's flowing out of me, but the living water that's the Spirit of God, the life of the Spirit of God is, is all about water and, and living water, and, and it's in my heart. God wants to, all this to happen in inside of me, right? Inside of you. God's desire is that your heart would be a place where there's life, where there's no fear of, 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 of droughts, of the pressures. When the pressures of life come, my roots are down in the, in the living water of, of, of God's presence, the Spirit of God. And so I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry when, when things get hard, right? I... Because my, my life is established in the presence of God. This is what God desires for us. He's what he desires for you. To be able to be in a place where you're not fearful of struggles. The world is a mess, right? The world around us is a mess. But we don't have to be concerned about so many things if our hearts are experiencing the love, the living water, the life of the Spirit, the roots, roots of our, our, of our belief, our, our life with God, going down into the water, the living water that comes from the Father. He then, Paul goes on and says, in verse 18, he says, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Power to understand. That's what sets us apart from the animal kingdom, right? We have, there's a power to understand. We, we can understand things that, that simple animals don't. I mean, they, but the creation of God, his creation around us, we talked about the birds and, and, and the beauty of creation is a reflection of God, but he says that you'll understand, as all God's people should, how wide, 
long, high, and deep his love is. I was listening to, to some guy who was speaking about the reality that that verse actually expresses something that's limitless. We'll have all eternity, all eternity to understand the love of God. And we'll still not understand it because it's just going to go on and on. But this is what Paul is praying for the church. He's praying for us. He's, he's making available for you and me to know the love of God. He wants you and me, he wants us to know the love of God, that it's wide, that it's deep, that it's high, and that it's long. So this is what Paul is praying and believing for us, to be able to know the love of God. It's a good thing, right? It's a good thing to know the love of God. Amen? Yeah? Yeah? So verse, eight, verse 19, the last of the four, four verses we're looking at today, says, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully, then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So here's the question. How do we experience the love of God? How do we experience the love of Christ? That may you experience the love of Christ. It's like a mystery, right? But I want to challenge you. It's, it's not a mystery that makes it unknown, right? That it's, you can't understand. No, it's a mystery to be explored, right? To understand. I was able to be in a, in a men's ministry gathering uh, when I was out in Oregon um, just a few weeks back. And they spent an hour. There were 20 guys around this table. And they, it's about an hour. Every man, the question was, how do you experience the love of God? And, and every man was able to share something unique. So here's the thing. For you to experience the love of God is different, will be different than someone else. When the worship service, worship time this morning, I just loved getting, it's just like, wow, God, you're so good. And, and for me to enter into worship is, is to know that God is, is, is good and God loves me, Right? For some people, that's not the case. But a good friend of mine, he gets up in the morning and he goes out and looks at the stars. He goes, oh, wow, or in the middle of the night, oh, man, there's no moon and the stars are just bright. The other morning, the sunrise, oh, the sky was painted. It was beautiful. And you see that and you go, oh, God, you're so good and you love. I just know your love. I thank you, God. How is it that you experience the love of God? That's something for you to think about. I challenge you to think about it. Dwell on it, right? Because this is something unique for you, the way God made you from your experience, right? And for us with children, right, we want to help our children. Look at that and help our children have awe in the world around them, right? The creation of God in in all of its splendor represents who he is. And we know from the scripture it says that God is love. So his creation is an expression of his love, right? But what is it? Think about it. What is it that for you to know God's love and you experience it? Words that are spoken. We can know the love of God through the words that are spoken. But in a face, in the face of a child, in the face of your spouse, in the face of a friend. I've recently been in situations where I've, I've looked in the eyes, just looked in the eyes of the other person in front of me, in a whole room, just looking in the eyes, not saying a word, and just look, just go, I see you, you're important, and I love you, and it communicated only through your eyes. There's, there's a power that we have in relationship. And I wanted to emphasize this, this thing. We're going to be made complete in him. Then that's what Paul says. We'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. 
So James 5.16 says, if we confess our sins one to each other and we pray for each other, it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. If we're all sinners, the Bible says that, right? We're not perfect. Then there's a need for confession. Paul tells us this, or James tells us this, confess your sins. Confess your sins to one another. If I, I, I think it's, it's something that we, in relationship with one another, we don't necessarily practice fully, right? Unfortunately, we come to church and we put our church, our church face on. We come to church and, and you know, I'm good. Oh, thanks. You know, and, and, it's, and it's, this is life, right? It's hard. Things are hard. I'm thankful for a really good friend who when I was in Oregon and I, and I, and I stumbled, right? I, I, I sinned, right? I did things, did something I shouldn't have done. I was able to call a friend up and, and confess it. And he heard and he prayed with me, you know? A friend's back here in Indiana and I was in Oregon. And God, God is in relationships. I believe it's in relationships where we, we truly will grow, right? We will grow in our understanding of who God is. I mean, there's all these other things, but the relationships that we have with one another in this church, super, super important. Super important that we're walking in openness and in transparency. In our family relationships, many of us are in this season where our parents are, are in, a, in a diminishing state, right? And uh, so I get to be in Oregon uh, for three, three periods of four weeks this year. A third of the year, no, a quarter of the year, I'm, I'm in Oregon, you know, with my father, who's, who's doing all right, but I need to be with him with my brothers and help my, help my dad I wrote a letter, I wrote a letter to a nephew of mine, and it was a condemning letter, because I knew things from a distance, I saw who my, what my nephew was doing, right? And I meant to get together with him, but I didn't, so then I wrote him a letter, and I'm so thankful, God is gracious, God convicted me before he received that letter. And I had even written him an email and confessing, hey, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to be judgmental. But it was the Spirit of God in me, right? The Spirit of God that convicted. But then to walk that out and, and, and to be able to be with brothers and, and people, my wife, so thankful for Diet. I don't think I said that in the beginning. You saw her, you know, I met her way back when, right? I couldn't do what I do without Diet. And I'm so thankful for the, the wife that God has given me to bless me and help me do the work that I do and to live a balanced life. <laughs> it's just a blessing, right? God has given us family. So in the context of family, right, um, I was able to confess to my, my, older, my elder, eldest brother, it was his son that I wrote the letter to. I said, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. I am full of pride, and I'm a judgmental person. And, and I'm really sorry. I blew it. Will you forgive me? And he did, right? If we confess our sins to each other, the Bible says there's blessing in that, right? But that happens in relationship. And there's, there's, a, there's a, a giving and receiving of, 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 of uh, friendship and and covering, Lord, God, God is present when we're confessing. I want to challenge you, challenge us, are you walking in confession? Are you walking in openness with one another, right? In your family, in your, in your friend circle, you know, we need to be able to confess, say, hey, I blew it, or I'm struggling, will you pray? And, and God is present in those in those at those times, right, when we need him to help us. And I believe 
We'll experience his love, God's love, more fully when we're walking in that kind of relationship with one another. Amen? Amen. It's really, really valuable, right? It's really valuable. So much of the upper room, I, I can, our church is a church that is a church based on the word, right? We know we, the word of God, and that's super, super valuable, right? But that's kind of a linear left brain kind of a thing. God, God is, is a relational God. And, and a friend of mine said, he said, I'm, I'm learning to be a whole, wholehearted, a whole-minded Christian, right? And it's in relationship that we, we can do these other things where we're experiencing life on life, forgiveness, openness, and we're able to live more fully in the love of the Father. Amen? So then he, find, he finishes the verse, the, the, this passage. So then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Made complete. We're not, you're not, I'm not complete. I'm, I lack how many of you could stand up and say, well, I'm complete? It's like none of us, right? None of us say, well, I, I, yeah, I'm, I've got it all, all together. Maybe Dell, maybe Brother Dell, right? You know, Brother Dell, he's gone, he's gone before us, and, and we honor him and we see, right? But, but I, if you spend a little time with Dell, he'd probably he'd be able to say, you know, there's, there's this one thing, right? This, so in eternity we're going to be made, but I believe Paul's desire and his plan is for us that we would be made complete now, right? Yeah, yeah. As we're in relationship with one another, that's God's plan, right? We would yeah. enter in, we would know the love of God, we would be living in it, Christ would be in us, and as we walk with one another, right, we, we take all of the Bible that we know and we, and we agree with and we love, and we live it. Live the Word of God. The word of God that we have in our language, right? Live it out. Amen. So 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, So all of us who have heard that heard, so no. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Made into the image of God? That's what being full of life and the power of God. Made into the image of God? That's God's purpose, goal for us, right? Is to become, bear, and, and, we're, and, and the reality is, right? As we walk in as believers, we're carrying the image of God to the world. Don't, don't be condemned. Be encouraged. Don't be condemned, be encouraged. The Spirit of God is in you, right? His desire is, is for you to know Him. To know Him. That knowing is going to happen more and more in your, in your family, in your marriage, in, with your children, and, and beyond that, right? But ultimately, God will be glorified. In, in the image that he, he's making in us. And this verse, set, wrote, Revelation 7, 9, will, will be in glory. In glory, we're going to see this. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of the, of the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. This is where we're going to be in eternity and every tribe, tongue, and nation is going to be present there. And it's something that we are walking in together as a church, right? And when I get to go to Africa, you know, and you're praying for me, we're a part of seeing this happen. But at the same time, it's like the love of God. I want you to hear Paul's prayer for you. We're just going to close, going to listen to some music here. And uh, I'm going to read Ephesians 4, 
a three, 14 and 19. Just to encourage you, open your hands. It's, it's a kind of a, a physical, physical way of, of saying, I want, to, I want to receive. I want to receive what God has for me, right? As this music plays and, uh, and I read this verse, these verses. So I encourage you to close, just close your eyes, shut out, shut out the distractions. Receive the word of God. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. The creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then you will make Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand us all God.